Hello, it's Jeffrey Christian from CPM Group. It's Friday, December 3rd, about 1120 in the morning here in New York. I wanted to talk today about gold and silver jewelry uh, demand and the relationship between jewelry demand and prices. Uh, you know, we've talked about a lot about investment demand and investment demand is much more volatile. It's a much smaller portion of the gold market and the silver market. Uh, but it is much more important in determining the price, partly because of the discretionary nature of investment demand and because of the volatility from period to period. Jewelry demand is very important for both gold and silver, uh, uh, but it, it, it's less volatile in terms of changes year to year, and so you don't necessarily see the price impact there. Also, the relationship between changes in the prices and changes in uh, jewelry demand are quite uh, different. Uh, you can see here, this is jewelry demand. The blue part is jewelry demand in uh, developing countries. The red part is in developed countries. You can see the two of them combined really represent the bulk of the market uh, for, for gold jewelry, uh, for gold demand. Now, I have to point out, we measure gold demand, not gold jewelry demand. So we're measuring where the gold is used in fabricating uh, products. You can see back in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of gold that was manufactured into jewelry in Europe and the United States and Japan in developed countries. Uh, Italy was the largest user of gold jewelry, uh, a producer of gold jewelry for, for many decades. Over the 90s uh, and, and uh, oddies, you saw a shift in the location of manufacturing. And a lot of companies in Italy, the United States, Japan, uh, France, Spain, Germany, uh, the UK, had, they continued to be jewelry companies, but they had their manufacturing shift to India, China, Thailand, other parts of Asia, or Turkey. Uh, so we are measuring where the gold is used because we're gold analysts, not jewelry analysts. Um, but um, that, that's where it is. And you can see that about 77% of fabrication demand goes into jewelry. Now, some of that jewelry demand is, in fact, quasi-investment demand. You have to be careful about it. You know, in India and China and other Asian countries throughout the uh, Islamic world, you'll see people buying gold jewelry as a form of investment. And it's not actually unique to those parts of the world. Prior to 1975, when uh, U.S. citizens could not legally own gold bullion, they would buy gold jewelry. And it was very common in the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, jewelers would buy these $5 pocket watches. They'd buy an ounce of gold. They'd cast a relatively crude uh, case for the $5 pocket watch. Uh, that was exactly one ounce of gold. They'd put the $5 po uh, watch into a $35 case and they'd sell it for $50. And consumers knew that they had an ounce of gold. Uh, so people find ways to get around regulations and it's not unique to Asia or the Islamic world that that happens. Similar situation in silver. Silver's uh, jewelry and silverware is less important uh, in terms of total offtake for fabrication purposes. Uh, the salmon colored portion here is jewelry and silverware. It's really several markets. There's jewelry as jewelry, jewelry as an investment demand, and the same is true with silverware, uh, sterling ware, you know, things that are bought to be decorative objects and things that are bought really as a, a, a quasi-investment uh, product. And again, silver fabrication demand, about 30% of it uh, of fabrication demand is jewelry, uh, the most price sensitive form of, uh, of demand. If you're going back to gold, you look at jewelry, other fabrication, which is labeled here as industrial demand and investment demand, you'll see jewelry is the bulk of demand. It's quite often 60, 70, 80% of, of total supply uh, goes into jewelry demand in a given year. Investment demand is much smaller, but it's much more volatile. You can see that back and forth over uh, year to year. And, and, and that has that price effect uh, that jewelry doesn't have. On a long-term basis, gold use per capita and per unit of 
GDP actually has declined in terms of use of G, uh, gold use per unit of GDP, which is the left-hand scale here. You can see it really was peaked in the 1960s, and that partly had to do with the fact that gold bullion was ownership was prohibited in most parts of the world, uh, except for maybe Switzerland and a couple other countries, until the mid-1960s. So there was a lot of surrogate investment demand in the form of jewelry. But gold fabrication demand as a per unit of GDP pretty much peaked in the mid 60s, came down hard uh, as the gold price was freed uh, and, and the gold price went from $35 to $68 uh, and then $200, came back up into the 90s and it's declined ever since. And on a per capita basis, it really peaked in the around the year 2000 and it has declined ever since. You had a series of, of deregulations, first in Europe in the mid 60s, the United States in 75, Japan got rid of its export right, restrictions on gold in 1979 or 1980, which opened up the, jewel, uh, the gold investment market there. A lot of that went into jewelry. Uh, then you had India in the 90s and China in the 90s, India in the 80s, China in the 90s. And, and ever since that time, it's actually been declining. Uh, so still very important. Now, I wanted to talk about this chart because, and the reason, the occasion for bringing up jewelry demand uh, was there's a very good article in Jeweler, Ma Jeweler Magazine, which is one of the top magazines in the jewelry industry out of Australia. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you the link uh, later in this presentation for that article about gold jewelry demand, trends that are going on, and the relationship with price. And that sort of reminded me that, you know, we really haven't talked that much about gold jewelry. Now we're coming on Christmas, it's Hanukkah, we've gone through Diwali, there'll be the Lunar New Year. Uh, so it's, an, it's, it's that period of time when jewelry demand, uh, gold jewelry demand actually rises. Um, there are different drivers for jewelry demand. One is the price, the price of gold bullion and the price of jewelry. And it happens at the manufacturing level and at the uh, consumer level. As you know, jewelers are very conscious that in different countries, there's a price point at which most people, consumers will buy gold jewelry and above which they don't really want to buy it. So they'll spend up to something. It used to be about $85 in the United States back in the 80s. It's probably about $100 now, it may be lower. It's lower in many other countries. You know, you see these very high price pieces of, of jewelry, but the vast majority of gold used in jewelry uh, is in, in much smaller uh, pieces. Uh, in the Islamic world, you'll see that too. So jewel, as the price of gold rises, jewelers will use less gold per piece in order to maintain that price point. When the gold price falls, they'll make heavier pieces, which are more attractive to wholesalers and retailers and consumers. And then the consumers will also buy and sell depending on the price. And it's very strange because sometimes you'll see uh, consumers actually buying because the gold price is rising. They're hearing about gold price rising in, in, in the news and that makes them, stimulates them to go out and buy jewelry. But typically what you'll see is that people will pull back from jewelry purchases when the gold price is rising. Other factors, income. The income elasticity is very uh, uh, strong in, in jewelry demand. When people have more money, they'll buy more gold jewelry. When they don't, when their discretionary income is down, they'll buy less. Fashion trends and advertising. So those are the factors that are there. Now this chart actually was a chart that we used in an open letter to uh, the mining industry in, in 2001, January of 2001. Uh, and the point that was I was making, and this article in the Jeweler magazine uh, talks about this article, uh, this open letter. In 2000, a, an, uh, a bullion bank actually proposed a $450 million three-year program uh, to the gold mining industry. Uh, give us $450 million in dollars or bullion 
over three years and we will promote gold jewelry. This was in 2000 and the price of gold was trading around $270 an ounce. Uh, the mining industry was really suffering. Uh, they were borrowing money from banks in order to stay in business. And, and this one bank, which actually was struggling uh, to justify staying in the bullion business itself internally, um, said, hey, give us $450 million in three years and we'll stimulate investment uh, jewelry demand and maybe that helps the price. Various mining companies uh, that used us as consultants said, what do you think of this proposal? And we produced uh, a, a letter for those clients uh, that included this chart. And we said, jewelry demand has gone from 20, 30 million ounces in the early 1980s to 100 million ounces as of 2000 or so, just below 100 million ounces. And the gold price has moved sideways. If you want to stimulate a higher gold price, you need to stimulate investment demand. Uh, jewelry demand can rise and rise and rise, but because it's negatively correlated to the price, you'll never drive the price of gold bullion higher by increasing jewelry demand. And if you do drive the price of gold higher, you'll see a decline in jewelry demand, which is actually what's happened subsequently. Uh, yeah, this actually was part of a series of discussions in 1998. We had proposed they create a publicly listed uh, fund that would buy gold and hold it on an allocated basis to make gold investment demand easier. Predicated on the view that if you wanted to drive the gold price higher, you needed to have uh, make it easier for investors to buy gold and that you should have it on an allocated basis because if you have it on an unallocated basis, it gets used uh, in a variety of uh, transactions, which then affect the, the, the spread in the gold price and can actually contribute to a somewhat lower price because of the effect on, on the spread in the gold price. Um, so 1998, 2000, we were talking about this. We produced this open this letter. And then the producers that were our clients said, can we make this an open letter, which we did. And we posted it on our website and Jeweler Magazine found it on our website somehow. I, I'm not quite sure where it is there. And so when they were writing this article, the ups and downs of gold jewelry in the topsy-turvy world, which came out uh, December 1st, um, when they wrote that article, uh, when they were writing that article, they came to us and they said, hey, you know, we saw this open letter from January 2001, and let's talk about it. And they used that information in that article. So you can download their article. It's pretty interesting. It's about gold jewelry, and it's a very, very good article uh, on gold jewelry. Uh, and then you can also download that five-page open letter that we did 20 years ago, 21 years ago almost now, which is still extremely relevant and insightful for people uh, in the gold industry. That's what I have to talk about today. You know, again, you can always buy real research from CPM Group. You can buy our yearbooks. A lot of these charts that you saw today were from our gold and silver yearbooks from 2021. They're available on our website. Uh, you can be a, uh, join our retail investor program. Uh, we'll continue to do open forums. November 17th is behind us. I apologize for not taking that out, but we will announce dates for the first two quarters of, of next year early, uh, soon. Uh, and there's an introduction to CPM Group video on uh, YouTube. And one of our clients told me that I desperately need to update that because we're doing a whole lot more than we used to do uh, in different areas. Our yearbooks will be coming out in the first half of next year. We're going to have a Platinum Group Metals uh, online seminar um, in um, January, Energies and Energy Metals and Materials uh, in February. We'll be at the Prospectors and Developers Association. Uh, as of today, they're still saying that they're going to have a physical event. We'll also have an online sem uh, seminar the, the week before the, the physical PDAC. And then we're working on the Future of Gold uh, Roundtable Seminar with the IPMI. So a lot happening in the first half of next year. Uh, that's all I have for today. We'll talk to you next week. And in the meantime, stay clean, stay honest, be good to yourselves, be good to each other. Thank you, bye.